So today we are going to continue with our conversation. And as I said last week, today I want us to look at theology as praxis. But uh, trying to introduce the African indigenous worldview and spirituality. So th these are two major themes that I intend to tackle. Towards the end, I shall introduce a little bit issues of education. And then the early part of next week, I shall conclude with this attempt to help you to enter into a view of what um, theology was even before, pre, uh, before colonial encounters. This is my aim for this um, lecture. So by way of introduction, I just raised some concerns. These concerns also came up last week after the lecture in one of the questions. Can we really talk about African religion, considering the diversity that we have on the continent? And I said that is a valid question, and that question continues to actually characterize uh, African theology, even today on the continent. We are also asking these questions. But we seem to agree on certain common basis with which we can continue with the conversation. So we are talking of African traditional religions with an S, plurality, acknowledging the diversity of expressions that we have in the different religions. And we shall look at that briefly. Um, we also talk of African traditional religion, however, as a system that relies on a singular philosophy that drives then the varied religious expressions that we have on the continent. And then based on the sing this singular philosophy, we also draw some commonalities that you find in, in almost all the religions. And here, when I'm talking of African indigenous religion or religions, I am particularly making reference to the sub-Saharan Africa regions. Some key notes to start with. We, ha we are all probably very familiar with this statement. Africans are notoriously religious. This was a statement that was uh, said by John Mbiti already in the 1970s when the pioneers of African theology started theologizing about religion, about Christianity, and about how human beings relate with God and with their fellow human beings. In BT says, he opens his book, African uh, Philosophy and Worldview, with this statement that Africans are notoriously religious. And he goes further to say that the notoriety of African religi religious nature is expressed in the fact that everything that the African does Religion permeates it. Religion permeates all the departments of life. You talk of education, agriculture, economy, health, everything. There's religion in it. Secondly, he indicates that each people, and here we are talking about ethnic groups, each people, each ethnic group has its own religious expressions. It has its own sets of beliefs and practices. So in actual fact, to study the religious systems of these different groups is also to study the people. And that is why most often in Africa, when we are doing African studies, it is difficult to do away with African theology also, because the two go hand in hand. Because from the beginning, to be a people is to have a religious expression that actually influences, that actually has a great impact on everyday life, on almost every aspect of life. And in fact, today, it remains the same. Therefore, Mbiti is saying that most of these uh, groups of people, or these ethnic groups of people, are about 3,000. Some other scholars even say that on the continent, when we're talking of ethnic groups of people, we can even be bold to talk about 6,000 thereabout. So, I want us to bring it to the Ghanaian context, where I come from. And I put Ghana in quotes for a purpose. I'm trying to enter into a discourse on religion before colonial encounters on the continent. And I am talking about Ghana. And that is why I put the Ghana in quotes here. 
just to say that I'm using Ghana in this context to refer to the geographical area that is now called Ghana, which was not there before the colonial encounters. We did not have that uh, geographic classification of a place called Ghana. Okay. So when you look at the census of 1960 in Ghana, it says that we have not less than 100 ethnic groups in just one country called Ghana, where I come from. <coughs> not less than 100 ethnic groups. And this also means that you will not have not less than 100 religions or religious expressions. For example, I am a Kasana woman. I come from the ethnic group of people called Kasana people. The Kasana people have their varied religious expressions, belief systems, and practices. Different, for example, from the Ghan people. The Ghan people come from the capital city of Ghana called Accra. A-C-C-R-A, -C -C Accra. Again, the Ghan people would certainly have different religious expressions, beliefs, and practices, different from the Ashanti. Ashanti is one of the strongest and powerful kingdoms in Ghana, um, well known in the books of history. Um, they also have certainly a different religious expressions, practices, and belief systems. You have the Guruni people, you have the Fanti, you have the Eve, you have the Dagaba, and so many other ethnic groups. And the many other ethnic groups also sh shows the many religions that we have. So you can talk of the Kasana religion. You can talk of the Gan religion. You can talk of the Ashanti religion. You can talk of the Dagaba religion, the Dagomba, and so on and so forth. Just to give us a, a, a view of how the different expressions show up on the continent. Now, I also want to say that beyond Ghana, we can talk of many others. So I've already talked of the Ghan religion, practice in Ghana, Ashanti religion in Ghana, and Ivory Coast. And now this helps you to understand why I put Ghana in quotation marks here. Um, Ghana and Ivory Coast, you have Akan people, the Ashantis belong to a bigger Amblara group called Akan. And these group of people can be found both in Ghana and in Ivory Coast. The Kasana people, I'm a Kasana person, can be found both in Ghana and in Burkina Faso. So you have Kasana expression of religiosity both in Ghana and Burkina Faso. Very similar language-wise, understanding of daily life-wise, how we express relationship with God and with each other, very much the same. The nature of our houses and what they express, the spirituality they, that the buildings express, very much the same, both in Ghana and in Burkina Faso. The same with Talancy people can be found also in Ghana and in Burkina Faso, for example. Now, I have left these other people. Okay, I, ha I also have every religion, both in Ghana and in Togo, for example. So the, the borders of Ghana, Togo, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, is not a thing before the colonial encounters. And that is the attention I want to draw here. Now, I have left these other ones with question marks just as a way of engaging the students, not my colleagues, but the students, that beyond this class, you can just try to find out these other religions. Where are they found? For example, the Bambara religion, where are they found? Which ethnic group are they and where are they found? The Dinka religion, the Noah religion, the San religion the Igbo religion, the Mende religion, Lupe, the Thief, the Yoruba, the Swana, Sosa, and Zulu. I'm sure most of these names, you already have an idea where they come from based on the fact that you have heard about, for example, Igbo, you've heard also about Zulu. But these are different ethnic groups of people and therefore different religious expressions of these people. Now. Beyond the fact that we are saying that we have diversity of religious expressions among the different people, most scholars on the continent agree also that there is a singular philosophy and there is a lot of commonalities among these 
uh, religions for which we can talk about African traditional religion as one. So I want us to delve a little bit into, first of all, the philosophy, and then we shall look at the commonalities, and then we can proceed from there. First of all, again, we go back to Mbiti, who expresses that though many religious expressions by different people on the continent, there is a singular philosophy underlying religious life in Africa. And he says the starting point of understanding this um, singular philosophy is understanding how religion permeates into all the departments of life so fully that it is not easy or possible to always isolate it. Across the continent, among Kasuna people, among Igbo people, among Zulu people, among the Nuar people, the Nuar of uh, Eastern Africa, the Zulu of Southern Africa, Kasuna from Western Africa, Igbo from Western Africa, it is almost impossible to isolate religion as a distinct phenomenon because it is so much, it permeates into all aspects of life, so much that you cannot actually isolate it. Now, in literature, we try to summarize the philosophy that drives these, the religious expressions of people as Ubuntu, a word that was borrowed from the Bantu uh, ethnic group of people, so it's a Bantu word, expressing uh, the fact that an individual being and personhood is only in relation. An individual's being and personhood is only in relation. It's in relation to and is dependent on other people in the community. Often we say Ubuntu is expressed in simple uh, phrase as I am because we are. I am because we are. And in BT, John in BT, one of the pioneers of African theology, would even encourage us to put an emphasis on it. That instead of I am because we are, we add that, and since we are, I am. Actually putting emphasis on the fact that as an individual being, your personhood is not to your individuality, but rather it is always in relation. And because you, you are, others will be. And if others are, you can be. And so it is a relationality of that calls also for reciprocity. So we are saying that the Ubuntu philosophy is a social anthropology which prize communal living as sacred and inviolable, as sacred, something that cannot be broken and that should not be broken. And in Bitty Feather writes a, an article admonishing Africans not to break the pot that once held them together, making reference to this communal living, reference to this communal living as sacred and inviolable. Um, I'm going back to my own country, Ghana, John Pobi. He says that to understand this communal living as sacred, we have to talk of what he calls cognatus ergo sum, to contrast sharply cogito ergo sum, which is very common in Western philosophy. In Western philosophy, championed by Descartes, we all know that the concept of I think, therefore I am, is a philosophy that really drives a lot of thinking and a lot of happenings in the Western world. But John Pobi is saying that for Africa, it is rather I am related, and here he asks by blood, therefore I am. So because I have a relation by blood, therefore I am. So he is saying that it is not the I, the individual, but rather what you want as an individual, but must be in relation with others. So he talks about the collective expression of the human being, the collective expression of the human being. So the concept of relationality 
is an important concept in the Ubuntu philosophy. So in summary, I am just saying that um, this uh, underlying philosophy in African indigenous worldview is that um, interdependence of the human persons in the community is often expressed in this particular statement. Not only in words, but in practice. And very soon I shall attempt to see to let you see in practice how I am because uh, we are is utilized in the community. And it's an important worldview, very much at the heart of every African culture. Every African culture. And it is also rooted in what we call ujama, that is a familyhood system. So the idea of family extending beyond the basic unit. So that is why I remember yesterday I was having a conversation with a, a European friend of mine, and I said, well, I will try to see if I can see my sister here in Germany. She said, you have a sister in Germany? I said, yeah, my, uh, my cousin, okay, my cousin, my uncle's daughter. <laughs> that is very difficult for me to do <laughs> as an African, because for me, that is family. She's my sister. She will even be offended that I have to struggle to be describing her as my uncle's daughter. It's my sister. So <laughs> it goes beyond the nuclear family. It goes actually beyond tribe and the community. And they, in fact, the concept of family in Africa has actually also a universal dimension. But later on, I shall also go into the complexity of how sometimes it becomes limited. But the concept is there. That is why, for example, when I was growing up as a child, when a visitor comes to the house, the hospitality that was given to this visitor, sometimes strangers that you don't know from anywhere, but the, you begin to receive them, treat them as though they were one with us, as though they were family members. The concept of family in Africa actually goes beyond the physical. It includes also the spiritual beings, the ancestors, those who have just died, are all part of the family. And in fact, those who are yet to be born are part of family. And this concept of Ubuntu is deeply rooted in this understanding of familyhood. Now, there is an interesting aspect of Ubuntu that I like to talk about when I encounter students. It's what I call the Ubuntu communicative model. Because among indigenous Africans, for Ubuntu to be able to be lived, it has to be done through communication. And that in literature we call palava. Again, I put palava in quotation marks because then it's a terminology that is not actually African. So then I'm using a kasana terminology, which is kabanikani, very, I mean the same like palava. Kabanikani is a term that I have coined based on the language used by kasana people from Ghana and Burkina Faso when they want to have conversations. They say, they would have me, avia banani. So for example, I remember as a very young person, and I'm saying this, that I was born after colonial encounters, but I live in a small community um, in a rural area of Ghana where you still have strong traces of this pre-colonial understanding and way of life. So I was a bit fortunate to experience it also. And I remember as a kid, there was the first time people started using drugs in my community. It was a big issue. And the elders gathered together and said, we know that there is something happening in the community. Young people get confused. They are not coordinated because they have consumed something. We do not understand it. So what they did was to call all groups of people, young people, avia banani, which means go, consult, and then let's see what to do. Women, this is something we have observed, avia banani. Children, avia banani. At the end of the day, conversations are happening among the different groups, and then towards seeking a solution 
to the phenomena that has been discovered. So I'm saying that palava, especially when understood from the con mind context, Kasana people, would literally mean to consult and then see what to do. In other words, we are saying that the communicative model that allowed Ubuntu to play out among the indigenous people was characterized by a required conversational and dialogical model for decision making within the community, basically for peace and for progress. For the community to be able to make progress and peace, this was required. We call it a communicative action. And it was a conversation on matters that affected society in general, that affected the family, that affected the clan or the community at large, or a phenomenon that the community is afraid that the neighbors have and it might certainly come in. We begin to come together and put ourselves in the different groups and to discuss these issues. Um, on issues affecting the community, problems, uncertainties, sensitive issues, and when strange and unexplainable events happen, it calls for kabanekani, it calls for palava. This always calls for a conversation on the matters. Now, it is important for us to realize that <clears throat> in the palava system, the process is not as if everything that is said will be taken. It is not everything that is said in the palava system that is taken. Rather, it is a moment for everyone to speak their own truth and share their own wisdom. So it's not everything you say that will be taken. However, the palava seeks to create space, and space in two senses, as a worldview. I have an article on this. I can drop it also on the Moodle for us. Palava, space as a worldview, but space as a real physical space of conversation that allows openness to everyone's view, open to several possibilities for the individual involved. So it gives a sense of belonging and relevance. The Palava system was to give people a sense of belonging and relevance, a sense of appreciation and validation, even if everything that is said will not be taken. And I want to put emphasis on that. Most importantly, it is a time of learning and formation. That is, it is within the context of Palava that younger people learn to know about their clan history, about the challenges that have ever existed in their clan, about the diseases that are possibly, uh, possible to be inherited within the clan for example, strange events that have ever happened in the clan are told to younger generation through the Palava system. It is a time to understand what information is lacking whilst gaining new perspectives of the family, of the clan, and of the community. I like to talk about Palava because Ubuntu cannot really exist without palava. And up to date, in indigenous communities that, communities that still practice this indigenous understanding of life, palava is still something that is very important. In marriage, in death, in birth, childbirth, palava happens. So when someone dies in the community, the elders are calling the women, they are calling the young people. Palava has to happen. The elders will also meet. So different roles, but within the different roles, palava has to take place. So the elders, for example, will have to determine where the burial will take place. The women will have to perform certain rituals in the room. And if the women do not come out to say that the rituals are okay and the men can go on, they cannot do anything. So there is some form of synergy after palava has happened so that progress can be made in the community. 
Now, I'm saying that when we talk of Ubuntu philosophy and issues of social cohesion, it is two ways. I want to start with the possible negatives. Because Ubuntu seeks to protect the life of every individual, because when Nora's life is touched, then Semi's life is touched. When Jonah's life is touched, then Brooklyn's life is touched. What happens is that in the community, strong solidarities are always built. Very positive. However, it can be easily turned into a negative strength. It can be easily turned into a negative strength where we can be talking about ethnocentrism, for example. Because when the group of people feel that the sacredness of the life of one of them is being threatened, the solidarities will turn into something else. And so we are, we are saying that in as much as Ubuntu is a great concept, in my view, there is also the need to guard against the possibilities of what it can turn into, the negatives. And when we start delving into the contemporary realities of the continent, we shall see how this same sense of solidarity is being used to cause chaos on the continent. We, we shall go into that. But for now, just to draw our attention to that. Also, still on social cohesion, we are saying that there are some core ideas in Ubuntu philosophy that are helpful for good human relations. First of all, we are saying that every human is a relational being, and this is exhibited in the communal solidarity that Ubuntu calls us to express. In time of grief, in time of joy, you don't celebrate alone. So for example, I remember when I was going to have my wedding, I was the student in Belgium, and then they were asking me how many people will come I can't tell how many people will come. Many people are going to come. Communal, I don't control that. I cannot give invitation card and say, come just by invitation. No. It's just like when I have funeral. Now you, you probably all know that my dad has passed or my house is always filled with people. You don't invite them. They will come to solidarize with you. This is how Ubuntu... Uh, plays out in relation to others. So in times of grief, you have all the support. In times of joy, they also celebrate with you. So its main insight is consequently, consequently based on the idea that as human beings, we depend on other human beings to attain ultimate well-being. Therefore, in indigenous worldview, it will be very strange for somebody not to be attending to other people's needs, expecting others also not to attend to them in indigenous African worldview, because we have to depend on other human beings to attain ultimate well-being. This also implies that the general well-being of a person depends on relationships. And now here it's important for me to draw attention to this. When we talk of the fact that in Ubuntu philosophy, the general well-being of the person depends on relationships, it is not just relationships between individuals, between families, between clans, but also relationship beyond the physical, the spiritual also the spiritual also. So the communal concept of Ubuntu that we are talking about is not only the physical relations, but also the spiritual, with the supreme being, with the lesser gods, with the guardian spirits of the community. Because all this, remember Ujama, encompasses all this reality. Any break in that relationship causes harm. So the relationality goes just beyond the physical. Draw attention to the fact that 
the Ubuntu philosophy gives some socioeconomic sense to the people. It has a lot of uh, socioeconomic meaning. For example, from an African perspective, certainly individualism and capitalism is not encouraged by this indigenous worldview. Because Ubuntu emphasizes or puts emphasis on the care and sense. Sorry, is everything okay? Okay. Yeah. It puts emphasis on the care and sense of concern for the well being of others as a main ideal which should guide human economic relations. And here I'm going to take my time to explain a little bit. This is in the books, but what I have experienced and what I have been told is that, for example, if my father has a cow, one, just one, and my uncle has another cow, and their other brother has a plow, they are rich. Because they need two cattle and a plow to be able to farm. So in the rainy season, nobody is poor in that community. The two cows are coming together, the two cattle will come together, and then the plow will come together, and all of them, they will go from one farm to the other, to the other, and all of them are rich. Farming takes place. This is just a practical example. And I was fortunate to still experience this. And even up to date, in my small village where I come from, this is still, we still have traces of this happening, especially in my own house, Atako house, Nontra house. It's still happening that the cattle of my father, my younger brother, my uncle, my senior brothers, that's cousins, they, during the rainy season, they don't separate whose cattle is whose cattle, no. The cattle all come together, they get a plow, and they start from the farm of this person, then the next farm is nearer, they go there and they go to the other farm. And at the end of the day, everybody is farming. Therefore, also, those who do not have children to help them to hold the plow and plow are taken care of because their brothers have children. So this is how practical it looks like. And so we are saying that everybody should have Ubuntu in relation to others and the strong sense of human solidarity is something that really exists in most African communities, pre-colonial times, and we still have traces of that even today. And I just want to permit me to show you a few pictures. This is communal farming happening among Kasna people, and this is uh, Yidania, where I come from, my village. My town is called China, but I come from a smaller section of China called Yidania. And this is a group of young men who come together. So normally, the understanding is that people of the same age go together. It must not necessarily be the same age, but generally that is how it plays out. But where necessary, different age groups can also come together to go to the farm and work. So this is my younger brother. This is on his own farm. And then he got other people coming to do this. He's not going in communal farming. It is, you go from, house to house, oh, tomorrow I'll be doing this on my farm. Tomorrow I'll be doing this on my farm. And all those who can come are going to come and help. And in the same way, when they have their farming happening, they also go around and those who can go will have to go for it. Things are changing. But as I said, I'm just trying to give you a picture of how indigenous worldview operated uh, before now. So beyond farming, we're talking of many things. I've already explained the collective riches that comes out of Ubuntu concept. The collective riches. Collective care is also something that Ubuntu gave to the people. My auntie Ayarpok died just a few months ago. She had never given birth to children. She never had a child. But in Ubuntu concept, the, 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 the husband's younger brother's children were her children. And so, when the husband even died, she did not have a child, but she never lived like a woman who did not have a child. 
It took only people in the family to really know that Ayakok had not delivered herself because one of the brother's children had to go to her room to live with her and build the home with her the, as though that was her, uh, his, her, his real mother. And this is how indigenous worldview of Ubuntu operated. We still have traces of it in, in some communities. And I have lived it. Collective care, for example, also means that when a child loses his parents at a very tender age, the social order would show who is supposed to take the child in. So I remember, and I, this is actually the story I wanted to start with, but I decided to bring it at this stage. I remember once the news broke in Ghana of an old lady of 80 years old who did not have anybody and was living alone and was suffering. And my uncle, who did not go to school, who is not a Christian, sat back, shook his head, and said, ah, Nora, your world of today, I cannot understand it. Because in the world that was handed over to us, I can, this is impossible. Because there's no human person that should be there without a family. Because family is not just your mother, your father, and your children. It goes beyond that. And she says, I find it very difficult to understand this concept. Because in indigenous worldview, when your children die, when your husband is dead, the next person in the family that is supposed to take care of you is there, and it's automatic. Nobody is going to say, oh, she's not my family, because it is family. Collective parenting is another thing, and I have personally experienced it growing up in the village. I was a child of every woman and every man. If you go out and you misbehave, it's not only your mother who can discipline you. Any elderly person who sees you misbehaving will discipline you even before you get home. And when you get home, you might be better off not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember once I went to fetch water. I had always been a bit active from childhood. I went to fetch water, and uh, they were playing football. I decided to play football. And this lady from my village was passing, and she saw me playing the football. She went and came back. She saw me playing the football. She went home, brought her container to fetch water, and she still saw me playing football. And it was getting dark. She called me, hey, kufonotra bayo, which means kufonotra, come here. So I went. She said, I am giving you just five minutes. If you don't go home, you are a woman, you are a lady, this hour, what are you doing here? I quickly got my water and ran home. I don't forget that. Because if I had really misbehaved, she would have disciplined me and she would have even reported me to my mother and she would have added. <laughs> so parenting among the indigenous African people is not left only in the hands of the real mother, I mean the biological mother and father. I've already talked about communal labor. Building is one of them. And in this indigenous concept of Ubuntu, you don't want to build a house and you have to go and start looking for a mason to come and you will pay him or her. Things are changing. Remember I said I'm trying to get us into the mindset of pre-colonial Africa. In that setting, you don't have to do that. All what you have to do is to get ready to build a house in your mind that I want to build a house. Your duty is to inform the young people in the village you want to build a house and tell them a day you are going to start. And when that day comes, all of them come. All you have to do is to cook food, in the afternoon so that they will eat, get strength, and continue with their work. You're not going to pay anybody any money for doing that for you. I 
I've already talked about solidarity during funerals, during marriages, during birth, and so on and so forth. This is another picture I showed already, similar to the ones I've shown. I actually have a video. I don't know whether it will play. This is about flooring of a house in indigenous setting. I just want to try to see if it will play. So permit me to try it and see if it will work for you to just have an idea of how we still have the trickling effect of this Ubuntu in some of the villages. Thank you. So this is a, a group of women who have gone to the house of another woman to help her floor the house. It is purely by information. I won't even call it invitation. It's information. You just inform them. I'll be floor, flooring my house on Saturday morning. And they will come, and joyfully so. The singing here is just to motivate them while they do the work. So, and the songs always can be of humor, calling for more solidarity, can also be a reprimand to the person that they have visited. So when they are working and singing, you have to listen to them carefully because there's always a message. Most often, it's motivation, but there can be a message. They can sing, for example, I ever heard in my own community singing a song like, um, the woman is not the type who shares her things. Uh, you have to be more careful. And they were using it. They were singing and smiling and laughing and working, but they were communicating. It was a way of reprimanding this person. That, but you see, the sense is that even in that context, they still came. They are aware of this nature of this person, but even in that context, they still came. That is Ubuntu. You do not leave a person because a person does not understand the need to be there for, for others. You have to be there so that that person can learn to be there also for others. Because that is the sense in Ubuntu. I will try to go back to my slide. So, you see, I have said that in the Ubuntu philosophy, the human being is considered to always have to be in relationships and not just with the physical, but also the spiritual. And I just want to introduce us to, first of all, the commonalities that we find among the different expressions, Kasana, Ashanti, Fanti, Bam, um, Igbo, Yoruba, Zulu. There are certain common features, apart from the philosophy of communal life that we have discussed. Because this philosophy of communal life that we have discussed runs through all uh, the ethnic groups, but also are other ones. A major among them is the understanding that the universe as a whole, hmm, all things in the universe are part of a whole. So it's, you always see the philosophy coming back into the concept. It's, it's, we are, it's in communion. So there's no sharp distinction between the sacred and the non-sacred. There's no sharp, between, sharp difference between the spiritual and the non-spiritual. As I am standing here, I believe, I, I, I live it, that my ancestors are here. That is typical African. That is typical. So the, we, we, the land is sacred. It's not only the, the, the places of worship that are considered as sacred. The rivers are sacred. And when we start going deeper into the contemporary reality, we will see how drifting away from this concept is affecting us on issues of ecology. I shall try to briefly uh, mention them also. The concept of a supreme being, the concept of a supreme being, a monotheistic concept of God 
is also common among all the African uh, religions. As one who is the creator, he provides, he sustains, and controls affairs. He is at the head of the spiritual world. This is a common belief among all the ethnic groups. You have the concept of the lesser or intermediary gods and guardian spirits. And these lesser intermediary gods serve with the supreme being. They serve with the supreme being. Shall I try to explain a little bit more about the spirit world and how the hierarchy explains in a slide further. There's also this common sense of the imperfection of human conditions. But these imperfections of human conditions makes rituals and rites very important. Because the belief, the common belief is also that rituals and rites actions may bring about relief from the imperfections of human conditions. So in times of health, sickness, in times of disasters, rituals may bring some about some relief. And this is also a common belief that uh, is there. We've already talked about the society itself as communal. Um, I want to take them briefly one after the other. So let's start with the supreme being. I've already said, among almost all the ethnic groups in sub-Saharan Africa, the supreme being as a God who provides, who rules over the world, is there. His nature is that he is supreme. He is one. However, there is difference in how he is perceived. There is difference in how he is perceived. For example, among kingdoms or people who are of a, a, monarchic, a monarchic tradition would see God as a supreme king. So he, the, the, the names that they give express kingly figure. So for example, among the Akan people of Ghana and also of Ivory Coast, you have names like Onyankupon, referring to God, the great one. Onyankupon means the great one, mighty, power. Nyami, the shining one, outstanding one, for example. However, in probably a cephalous group of people like myself, I'm Kasana, but it's very similar to the Talansi and Gurini people of Ghana and Burkina Faso. They will say Wini means sky, the heavens, a God that is available. And in our view. So in as much as the concept of the supreme being runs across the, the, the ethnic groups, there are also variations on how he is perceived, depending on the structure of a particular ethnic group. Now, in the spirit world, the supreme being is the head of the spirit world. He is the head. He is involved in human life and reality, but at the same time, there's some form of delegation of lesser goals who also occupy the world. So it is believed that the world is made up of both the supernatural and superhuman beings. And there is the understanding that these um, lesser gods live in closer or nearness to God and his power than just ordinary human beings. You have other influential spirits that include spiritual guardians of communities. For example, I, ha I know mine. I'm from China. My town is called China. And in China, our spiritual guardian is Zambao. So you walk around, and when you meet a Kasana person, and you tell the Kasana person, oh, I am Zambao Boko. I, I, I Zambao Boko mean I am Zambao's daughter. The person knows you are from China. So the same ethnic groups, but different communities. But just the statement of the name of my spiritual guardian can give somebody an idea where I come from. Because this spiritual guardian is particularly for my community, for example. The spirit of the departed souls. 
those who are venerated ancestors. But also the ordinary dead are part of the spirit world. And they are part of the community. Now we are saying that spirits are elements of power. In indigenous worldview, spirits are elements of power, force and authority, and vital energy found everywhere. That is the emphasis that I want to draw, found everywhere. Everything of the world is inhabited by spirits. And now normally, things that normally command awe, beauty, wonder, power, are identified more with spirits or spiritual power, for example. For example, you have two rivers who meet, but their water never mixes. River Pry and River Densu in Ghana. The indigenous worldview would believe strongly that there is a special deposition of the spirit in such a place because of the awe it commands. You see a great mountain that looks like it is hanging, for example. So in this, this is the, the, the spirit world and how indigenous people understand it. Now, what is also important is that in the indigenous worldview, everything is sacred. It's not just the place of worship. Life itself is sacred. The sacredness of life, of the land, of the earth. That is why in most African cultures, in fact, it is called the Mother Earth. The Mother Earth. Let's also talk about another important aspect which is uh, common among all the religions, rites and rituals in Africa. Uh, rites are a major component of life. And we talk of the rites of passage, which normally from birth, adulthood, marriage, um, and then death, for example. Uh, so there are normally practices, customs, and ceremonies that people perform to move people smoothly through one stage to another. So from the beginning of life to the end of life. We also have other rituals apart from the rites of passage. So at birth, there is a rite. Even when your mother is pregnant, there is a rite among our people to perform. To give you smooth passage from wherever you are coming from, into the physical world. And when you are born and as you are growing into adulthood, there are rights to usher you into adulthood, puberty rights of several kinds. Other rituals that are also very important and linked to the fact that they can bring about some form of relief to the imperfections of the human world would include sacrifices, libation, and so on and so forth. These are done through ritual leaders. These are done through ritual leaders. Um, here, it is important for me to mention that these ritual leaders in indigenous systems were not necessarily men. Were not necessarily men. They could be men, they could be women, depending on the, the particular ritual or sacrifice that needed to be made. Sacred spaces, I have mentioned it briefly already just to draw uh, our attention to the fact that, for example, in many Western philosophies, you, for example, with Emil Dachem, you have categorization of things in society that are sacred and those that are not sacred, sharp distinction. In indigenous worldview, this is not the case. So there's a sharp contrast there also in terms of philosophy uh, on spaces or sacred spaces and places. The universe is seen only in terms of the sacred. The skies, the earth, the matter of humanity, all is sacred. Human life is sacred. Mystical forces is another common thing that runs through all the religions. So in addition to the sense of vital forces that I have discussed already, uh, many Africans would 
uh, recognize other types of forces. These forces are not superhuman, neither are they simply human. So they are not really like the spirit delegation of God, but neither are they also simply human. So they lie somewhere in between, <laughs> and then they, they include magic, witchcraft, and sorcery, for example. These are human expressions of certain um, spiritual nature or, or power. Um, they affect, like, the spiritual forces, like they believe in the spiritual forces, these uh, mystical forces affect people's lives and the, the lives of their community in, in, in many ways. Uh, when people have problems, they go for sorcery to discover the cause of the problem, and a lot of things are coming up. And I hope that when we are looking at ecumenism, we can also discuss this, because this is an important dimension, mystical forces that is still influencing Africans today, even in Christianity. So Christian leaders have to constantly battle issues of witchcraft, issues of prophecies in relation to sorcery, and so on and so forth. So we can look at all that also. I just want to conclude this particular uh, discourse by stating that um, indigenous African conception of God and how God wants us to relate with each other and how the world looks like in relation to God has often been oral tradition. It has been handed over from um, one generation to the other through oral tradition. There are no scriptures like we have in uh, Quran or Bible or the Vedas. No, we don't have that. It has often been in oral tradition. However, in recent times, there is a kind of attempt to document it. However, no matter how we document this understanding of uh, spirituality or of Africa, it cannot be considered as scriptures. So it's important to draw a note on that. It will not be scripture. It's just a documentation of the experiences that the people are making. And we would not refer that as, to that as scriptures. Because this understanding is handed over from one generation to another. I am going to draw some conclusions on how education played a role in handing over this understanding or this worldview to others. Because in education, in pre-colonial Africa, education was very important in the community. But it took a different character. It took a different dimension. And I'm going to do that again through the lens of Asare Danso, a Ghanaian writer who tried to explain how pre-colonial or indigenous African education worked. It was communal oriented and very practical education, communal oriented and very practical education, aimed at helping an individual to understand the family, the clan, community history, the spirit world, and the social order. The methods, because it was communal oriented and very practical, the methods were, so, were also very practical. It was done through demonstration. So when they are building, almost every young person in my community would have known how to build. It's not the same today anyway, because you see them do it. Every young man in my community, I can still boast, knows how to farm. Because the method of learning how to do it is by seeing. So hands-on training was also something very important through farm, like farming, weaving, pottery, trade. It's because your clan was trader, were traders, you learn to be a trader. Because as they do it, you learn how they do it. Weaving pottery was the same. I remember as a young girl growing up in the village, my elder sister will be called by the elderly woman. Tomorrow we are going to pick share nuts. So join us. Go and learn. Don't just go to school. It's not enough for you to just go to school. Learn how to do this also. So they managed to get my elder sister to go with them to pick share nuts about three times. 
and she still enjoys the experience up to date. Music and dance was a way, a method of teaching. As I said earlier on, when we saw in that video, music can be used to communicate a lot of things among Africans, especially in my particular ethnic group. So when there is music, before you start enjoying the lyrics, you have to understand the, <laughs> the words and what it is meant for. We use music to tell the history of a particular family and clan. We can use music to tell where your grandmother came from and how she was gotten, for example. Music is used to communicate the news of a new wife in the family. Up to date, that is still something that is very common in my village. That how you will get to know one of your brothers is getting married is when you start hearing certain songs. You say, wait, what are they saying? Then through the words of the song, you know, ah, they are bringing a wife to the family. They are bringing a wife to the village. Then you have to wait and listen, which particular clan in the village? Then you have to be attentive again, and then the words will direct you to the particular clan, and then again, the words will direct you to the particular family. So music is something that was used to do a lot of things. A major amount there was also to educate young people. For example, when I was growing, we still had music that taught us the difference between uh, living a virtuous life as a woman, the, the, the benefits of living a virtuous life as a woman. The title of the song is Kayane Kaya Chozarba. It was a song that was sung, and the song meant a lot for girl child education, for young people. Proverbs is another way, method that was used. We are losing that also fastly because we don't remember the Proverbs. And even when we remember, they don't make meaning to us. <laughs> but in the indigenous setting, Proverbs were very important and they taught lessons. One of the proverbs I like so much that is commonly used among my people, especially in my clan, is that which means to remember the past and put emphasis on it will destroy the home. Calling for ability to move beyond difficulties when they happen, forgive and learn to move forward. So for example, when two brothers have had a terrible past of disagreement and the elders meet after so many years and they see the tensions of that rising, then you hear that proverb, imagine. And storytelling was another way, method of teaching. Again, children of this generation would not uh, enjoy that, but I was again fortunate to experience a little bit of storytelling as a method of teaching. So it was a duty of the elderly women in the home and men in the home in the evenings to gather young people, tell them stories as entertainment, but most importantly, as an educational tool. Riddles were also used, folk tales and puzzles. In summary, the goals of such education in pre-colonial times was to develop healthy attitude towards honest labor, develop child's latent physical skills, for example, through music and dance. Uh, so uh, I remember we had a conversation when we were training as teachers whether there were sports in indigenous African settings before. And some people were like, yes. Others were like, no, sports is a recent thing. That is not so true. Sports is not a recent thing. In indigenous African sense, um, physical skills were advanced through several means, basically through dancing, through music, through hunting, and so many other uh, activities. Proper upbringing of the child in character to develop a sense of belonging to participate actively in the family, the clan, and community affairs. This was something very important. And today, old men and old women are so much afraid because the current form of education that we have does not take care of this dimension. And, and, and so it's a big challenge and concern for those who are going. To understand and appreciate 
and promote cultural heritage of the community at large. And then to develop intellectual skills, instill in children respect for elders and those in position of authority. That is something very important among many African cultures. Uh, and then to acquire specific vocational training and skill on which you would survive, on which you will survive and take care of your family. I want us to guess something. Uh, do I still have time? Yes, I do. So I can do this. Who were the teachers? Who were the teachers in, the, in this particular uh, system of uh, education? Who were the teachers? Who do you think were the teachers? Yes, Jonas? Okay. Maybe the aunt or, yeah, any other idea? Yeah, it's, 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 it's correct. It's related to it because the teachers were all the elders in the community. <laughs> all the elders in the community were the teachers. Character formation was not left in the hands of just mama and daddy. It was all the elders in the community. May I just put a small note, the responsible ones. For example, drunkards were not people that would be considered as <laughs> teachers in the community. Of course, nobody would tell you not to teach the child, but by the nature of the fact that you have rendered yourself irresponsible, you are not giving the value to an extent of being considered as an elder in the community who can really impact uh, knowledge in people. So basically, we are saying that in pre-colonial or in indigenous African system, the content, what we would call curriculum today, would include issues of protection of the environment based on the spiritual conception of, the, of, 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 of community. Protection of the environment was very important. I still remember there was a particular grove. Today, it's not there. I don't know how it disappeared. I don't know what happened to it. When we were children, Nobody was supposed to touch that area. It was a sacred, super sacred place. And it really allowed my village to have a lot of, you know, um, green trees and all that. But it has suddenly disappeared. Social relationships was another important aspect. Uh, helping young people to know how to relate with each other in the amount they appear, but to relate with each other in times of difficulties. And I'm still proud that in my village, I still see a little bit of this social relationship dimension coming up. The children, are, the young people are still aware of it. For example, the last funeral that happened in my house and I was there, we were seated in the room where the women were. And then they were preparing and then the young men would come in and stand by the door and say, ah, Ma, have you not, are you not ready for us yet? And the old ladies would say, no, go, go and wait for us. Give us time. And then finally, when they came out and gave the men the go ahead to start the roles that they also have to play, I came out because I am the daughter, I'm a daughter of the house. I sometimes can play a dual role. And when we, when we come to the gender issues, we can look at that also. So I came out to join my brothers. In this sense, I could play that role as the daughter of the house. So when I came out to join my brothers, I realized that when they had done their rituals and were ready to start the digging, the younger generation of a particular, I mean, young people of a particular generation, nobody called on any of them. Nobody called on them. They got up by themselves, started calling each other, giving each other something, and then they said, ah, are they ready? And said, yes. They started the digging. They started the digging. And then another generation came together and started asking of, how do we receive the in-laws? So I was observing, and in my boot as a researcher, I started taking note of these things, because these are things I read and write about. But this time, I am living it. It's, it's, it's an experience I was making. So just to say, a bit of it is still there. The spirit world, the, it was also important for, for young people to understand how the spirit world is and how it relates with everyday reality, entrepreneurial skills and leadership. In conclusion, for today, and then we'll pick up again next week 
especially through the uh, looking at the gender issues. I just wanted to conclude by saying that African spirituality is a living reality. And we will be seeing that as we delve into even contemporary times. Irrespective of the crisis and the confusions, you still see African spirituality as a reality that still influences what we do. Um, it permeates every aspect of human life. It is based on the communal life of Ubuntu, and Ubuntu expresses communal living as sacred and most valuable. And as I said, next week, it will be my hope that we shall conclude this pre-colonial conception of theology as praxis, looking at the gender aspect, which I couldn't capture here because I was afraid that I would not make it with time. And then the second part of our lecture next uh, week, we shall try to look at the, what I will call the interruptions that happen in history. And then that will allow us to pick the different theologies that are emerging in the coming uh, weeks as we go. So this is it for me today. Thank you.